calls for diabetic medications this past month than, uh, than I've gotten in the last few months because people are now realizing that, hey, you, you really need to control your chronic conditions. So my biggest piece of advice, number one, is control your chronic conditions. Make sure they are under excellent control. Number two, um, hand washing is by far the most important thing. Um, we, you know, I wash my hands on a, on a busy day. I wash it about 40, 50 times a day. Um, you know, healthcare workers know this. You wash your hands before and after you use the bathroom. So it's, um, you know, the way that this virus, um, as far as we know, is transmitted uh, is through respiratory droplets, which means that if you touch something and then you touch your face, uh, you, you can possibly be exposed. And so anything that you touch that you are not 100% sure of, which is pretty much almost anything, you should wash your hands after. Um, you know, the, the, the fat membrane that surrounds viruses is actually um, destroyed by soap and water. So hand washing is really the, the best way to prevent the spread of viruses. Now, if you can't, um, if you can't wash your hands, then that's where an alcohol-based sanitizer is, is helpful. Um, but, you know, we have alcohol-based sanitizers at home and in my office. Uh, there's no reason to use it because we have sinks. So I really only use my alcohol-based sanitizer when I'm out and about and I don't have ready access to a sink. So number one, controlling your chronic conditions. Number two, um, you know, making sure that you do very good hand washing. Number three, um, you know, wearing masks if you go out in public. I know that there's been some, some varying advice and you know it's it's kind of hard to know what to follow the general rule of thumb is you know you wear masks and you wear masks for two reasons one you wear a mask to protect others and two you wear a mask to protect yourself so there's a great graphic where you have two people side by side one person is not wearing a mask and the other person um, is it can still transmit, but if they're both wearing masks, we're both protecting each other. Um, there's obviously different types of masks. You can, you know, we've heard a lot about the N95, respirators, surgical masks. Really, for somebody who is um, out and about in, in the general public, really, uh, if you have a surgical mask, great, but, you know, any sort of face shield, cotton-based, will, will work. Um, really, uh, you know, masks definitely are, are hopefully making a difference. We think they are. So those are the things that we would say um, can, can help prevent um, just really being very cognizant of, of what you touch. And, um, you know, my, my wife is a physician as well. And we have a, uh, you know, we have a routine, you know, when we, when we come in, when we come in from work, you know, we, 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 we completely uh, our, 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 our changing areas downstairs in the basement. We have a separate shower that the kids do not go to. You know, we don't come upstairs into the house until, um, you know, until you've completely washed, change your clothes and, and usually showered. And um, so just really being very cognizant, um, doing the same thing the same way every single time. It's just, it's a marathon. So really making sure that we're doing everything each and every time. You know, that's the best way. Um, you know, when surgeons scrub in to the OR, uh, it's a very routine way that they scrub in. They wash their hands, they wash their, their hands in a very unique fashion. They do it the same way each and every time. So that consistency is, is key. That's why I feel comfortable taking care of COVID positive patients, which we've been doing because I am being extremely consistent and, and doing it the same time, the same way, every single time. So uh, hopefully that gives just a little bit of insight in, in preventative. As far as age and comorbidities, so we do know that, um, you know, not 100%, but a general rule of thumb is if you have an eight-year-old patient and then you have an 88-year-old patient. The 88-year-old patient, it's more likely that they are on certain medications, that they have chronic conditions. So any chronic condition, um, including obesity, is a risk factor for having a worse outcome to COVID-19. Now, anybody can catch COVID-19. So having a chronic condition does not make it more or less likely that you will catch COVID-19. All it does is that it means that if you have a chronic condition that is not well controlled, your risk of, uh, of having a bad outcome 
is higher. So if we use that logic, that is where the recommendation of patients um, above the age of 55, 65, you know, are, we're seeing are much more immunocompromised. Having said that, you know, there are a lot of younger folks that are unfortunately succumbing to this condition as well. Um, you know, there's, there's some antidotal evidence about, you know, men having a little bit of a worse outcome than, than women. Um, and, you know, things like, uh, you know, asthma, things like hypertension, things like obesity, things like uncontrolled diabetes, these just, just raise the risk factor. So really controlling those chronic conditions is key. Um, yeah, a, so, a primary, yeah, no, so like a, 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 an, a 77 year old with no chronic conditions who you know doesn't have diabetes or any uh you know it's non-smoker um if you compare that person that 77 year old to a 35 year old who's got diabetes chronic conditions what have you so i i yeah i mean it's sort of the uh in the media everything is about, you know, older adults, high risk, what have you, which I think is good, but it is sort of creating sort of this ageist dialogue that, you know, all old people have chronic conditions and their risk factors, and it's probably not necessarily true. However, we do know that the immune system, it, it, do we know that the immune system is weakened as we grow older? Is, or is, is that not necessarily a, sure. a the way that I would I would answer that is I would say that um, there's often less of a reserve. Um, so the example that I give is that uh, you know in you know our, our young military, our young soldiers are having horrendous um, battle injuries and, and trauma, and they're they're um, they're surviving because number one there's really good medical care out in the front line, but also they don't have chronic. A lot of them don't have chronic conditions, and a lot of them just have more of a reserve. So the way that I would, I would answer that is, uh, you know, as we tend to get, as we get older, um, our reserve, our ability to bounce back can be diminished. Again, that's not saying that's 100% across the board. I've seen some very healthy, you know, 85-year young uh, individuals that are healthier than my, you know, 35-year-old patients. So, um, but, you know, we, our reserve does you know, tend to statistically decrease. And that is, um, that's a factor. And there's just still a lot that we don't know about how this virus um, is, is affecting because we are seeing, you know, young and old patients. In the beginning, there was some thought about, um, you know, very young patients, you know, kids doing fairly well. And the, the thought was because COVID-19 is, is the coronavirus and, you know, coronavirus has been around forever. We've all been exposed to the regular coronavirus. It is, you know, the cause for the common cold. So kids, you know, who gets sick all the time? Little kids do. So little kids get coronavirus, they get rhinovirus. These are things that just happen. Um, this COVID-19 is the, a new type or a novel type of coronavirus, which um, you know, nobody's been exposed to before, which is why we are, we are you know, having such a, a bad outcome with this. But the thought was that kids generally are more exposed to the regular coronavirus. So the thought is that maybe their immune system is, is actually used to this type, even though it's a, it's a novel coronavirus. But right. um, yeah. Cool. Okay. We got a bunch of questions, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, and we're gonna try to get to those. We, uh, okay. Don't worry, guys. If you typed it in Q and A, um, but Beth is uh, has raised her hand to speak. So Beth, um, can you hear me? I think she might be on mute. Okay. Come on, Beth. Okay, well, while we're waiting for, Be I've clicked the unmute button. While we're waiting for Beth, uh, there was a question on there. It, and I know that there's a lot of people with the same question is that, Dr. Sinha, how does a certified home care agency engage with your practice beyond calling the front desk? Uh, sure. So we are, uh, you know, obviously you can, 
you can call us, um, you can email us. Uh, that's really the best way. And you can email my, my office staff, you can email me, um, you know, you can call me on my cell, uh, you know, we're, we're available. Um, you know, when I'm out and about, you know, if my staff doesn't answer, my, my cell phone rings if you call. So we have num multiple numbers coming into, um, into my cell phone. Um, you know, we don't have an answering service and I'm, I'm very proud of that fact that we don't have an answering service. So, um, you know, about half the time uh, my staff will answer. I'd say about at least half the time I'll answer directly. Um, if we don't answer, that means we're both on the phone and just leave a voicemail. We get back to everybody. Um, but yeah, email, phone, um, and then if, uh, if, you know, you can also text as well. Okay. All right. Beth, can you, uh, can you hear us? It looks like I've still, you're still muted, but um, uh, anyways, okay. Well, let's get to some of these other questions here. Um, Cindy asks, I was providing home visits for physical therapy prior to COVID. I don't feel comfortable going back home, back to home care yet, as I've only have an N95 mask, but nothing else. Even if my clients, even if my clients don't want me to come back. Um, I, I sort of feel like Cindy, you may have answered your own question there, but it's one that I know that many people in our audience are faced with is the lack of PPD um, and uh, the ability to take the precautions like Dr. Sinha, it was citing how he makes a home visit. Without that PPD, um, I highly recommend nobody going into their clients' uh, homes. What, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Sinha? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's, um, again, it's multiple layers, multiple redundancy. And it starts from, um, you know, it includes washing your hands, it includes changing your, your clothes when you come home. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, PPE is really important. Um, in a perfect situation, in a perfect world, which, you know, even, you know, six months ago, you know, we would, you know, we would change, you know, N95s with every patient that we see, we, you know, go through multiple gowns and multiple gloves and, you know, we, you know, but in, in, in this current day and age, you know, PP is very difficult to come by. So what we're seeing is uh, a lot of the hospitals are issuing one P, um, one N95 uh, for their healthcare worker that they use for their entire shift. Uh, and then on top of that, there's another mask, whether it be a surgical mask, whether it be a uh, cloth mask, uh, and then on top of that, a face shield or some eye protection. Uh, I'll tell you what I use is I have, um, for each patient that I see, I have about six to seven pairs of gloves that I have in my, my scrub pocket uh, readily available. Um, I have an N95 and then I have a surgical mask that I put on top of that. Uh, if I'm not wearing my glasses, I'll wear eye protection, um, goggles, and then on top of that, I may have a face shield as well, um, depending if I'm seeing a confirmed COVID positive that I'm seeing close up. You know, you have to listen to their lungs, you have to get in pretty close, so, um, so that's the protection. And on top of that, I'll, I'll have a gown if, uh, if, um, you know, if I'm seeing them close up. When I walk into a patient's home, um, and uh, let's just say for argument's sake that they are COVID positive, or if I walk into a facility or a community that I know has COVID positive patients, um, I, I often will not wear a gown unless I'm going in very close with a patient, uh, but some communities, some facilities are, are requiring that everybody wear a gown, um, but I'll always wear the mask and I'll be very cognizant with my gloves, you know, because if you have your gloves on and if you touch something, consider your gloves contaminated. You have to change them before you, you touch yourself. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I, no, I think that was, I think that was pretty good. The um, I'm, I'm jumping around on the questions now, cause I want to get to some of the ones that I think are more in, that are very intriguing, but I'm going to try to get to all of them. But um, Amanda Gordon says, do you do urgent admissions? What is the time between when a patient calls you and when they can actually be seen at home? Sure. Great question. Um, you know, it's always a fire drill <laughs> and, you know, it's not that often where somebody will call and say, Hey, you know, can you see me at some point in some week? So all the adult protective service cases are always urgent. Um, a lot of 
times we'll get calls saying, hey, this patient needs to be moved to a facility yesterday. Um, can you come in? So we will, we will absolutely do our best to accommodate within, um, definitely within that week, usually within a day or so, if it is a truly urgent case. Um, if it's something that can't, uh, that can wait, maybe we'll, we'll do it as a triage system. So um, if somebody, you know, needs to get in um, by the end of the week, we'll, we may see them in about three or four days and kind of save that, that, you know, the next day visit for somebody that, that, that is a true emergency. So we'll, we'll see patients pretty quickly. Ooh, uh, Karen Akers has a, a good question. Can you let us know how to put together a COVID kit? so that if we do get sick, we have what we need to help us be more comfortable during the illness. And then two, is an oxygen pulse monitor helpful? Can you tell us why? Sure, so hi, Karen. So I'm a big fan of Karen and, uh, and the Acres Leadership Group. Karen has worked very closely with Bellevue, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honored that you're on. Hope you're doing well. Um, so great question. So COVID kit. So one of the things that, uh, that, you know, we have to think that it's a virus. So what would you do for a regular virus? What kind of symptoms would you expect when you have a virus? So, you know, over-the-counter medications, Tylenol is, as long as you can take Tylenol, is probably the best thing to take. There's some question about whether or not ibuprofen um, may exacerbate things. And, you know, I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that. So to be out of an overabundance of caution, I'm recommending Tylenol for now or acetaminophen. Um, and then, you know, having things like nasal sprays, having things like um, multi-symptom cough and cold relief, things like NyQuil, DayQuil, you know, assuming that you can take these. Um, making sure that you have a good thermometer. That's, that's critical because my advice is going to be different if somebody has a temperature of 99.5 versus somebody has a temperature of 105 you know my advice would be very different so knowing what your temperature is very important having a um, other devices like a blood pressure cuff you know I'm I'm a doctor so of course I'm going to say this but I think everybody should have a, a blood pressure cuff in their home um, you know it's important to know what your what your regular numbers are having um, you know, a, a, a pulse oximeter uh, is not a bad idea, but you have to take it with a grain of salt because, you know, pulse oximeters, you know, even if they're off by three or two or three points, that could be a really big deal because somebody who's, you know, 94% versus somebody who's 91%, you may change what you do, but it's still a good idea to have extra data. Um, so you can get pulse oximeters, you know, relatively inexpensively from Amazon online. Um, things like that are important. One of the other things that maybe not everybody needs to have in their COVID kit, but I think everybody should have, generally speaking, is their, their um, you know, if they have any sort of living wills, if they have any power of attorneys, if they've had any thoughts about having their loved ones having a, a do not resuscitate order, you know, any condition is you know, is any medical condition that causes you to go to the hospital, those documents are important to have. Um, but these are, you know, this is as good of a time as any to have that conversation and to know what your, your future wishes are. It's not an easy conversation, but an important conversation. So having your medications readily accessible, your chronic medications readily accessible, now is not the time to run out. I've been telling patients to, uh, to call their doctor and ask for, you know, a, a full three month supply if they can. And, um, you know, most medications are available from the pharmacy, but, um, but you know, you really want to have your medications in stock. So, you know, the common sense things that you would have um, is what you should have on hand. Okay, uh, well, great. Um, Jennifer Brown asked a question, and I'm, I'm curious about this one myself, is if you use a standard surgical mask for routine outdoor walks, how often and how long should you reuse that mask? Is the answer different if you're using an N95 mask? And I'm, I, I believe the N95 masks are supposed to be for one use, correct? Uh, yeah, all, you know, by definition, all PPE should be single use, single patient use one time. Wow. That's in an ideal situation. Um, you know, you don't, you know, when, when you're in the OR or when you're in a, um, in a infectious situation in the hospital, you're not, you're, you know, you don't reuse the gloves. You don't reuse um, your masks, technically speaking. 
COVID has, has changed the way that we, we have to practice. And, you know, I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of field medicine. I work with a, a federal disaster team. So, you know, we go out and, um, set up field hospitals during hurricanes and things like that. And, you know, those, those are battle conditions and we are in battle conditions right now. So, um, you know, the definition of battle conditions is we, we don't have uh, the supply that we need. So ideally PPE would not be reused. Having said that, uh, we are having to reuse it. So that is why for the N95, we wear a second mask on top of that to protect the N95. And, you know, that first mask um, theoretically is the soiled mask. So to answer your question specifically, um, you know, if it depends on your supply, if you have a box of surgical masks and if you have access to it, then theoretically you should discard it after each time you use it. Most people don't have that luxury. So um, usually if you're reusing a cloth, then you know you should wash it after you, you go out and about. Um, as far as a surgical mask, there's not a really good answer as to how often you can use it. I'll tell you what I do personally. I have masks in the front seat of my car. And whenever I go into a community or a facility or a home, um, I'm, I'm not reusing those masks because I don't want to transmit it to anybody. But if I'm not exposing myself to anybody, if I'm not seeing patients, if I'm just going out for a walk, um, you know, I'm fairly confident that I can put that mask on and I haven't exposed myself to anybody, nobody's come by me, then, then I would feel comfortable reusing that mask. I mean, if it's soiled or if, if you definitely used it in close proximity, then, then I would be hesitant about reusing it. Yeah. It's not a clear cut answer. So I, I wish yeah. I had it. Well, that's good guidance. I mean, and, um, and boy, these great questions coming in guys. And, and again, on the con on on the chat, make sure that you're sending your chat to panelists and attendees. That's way everybody can see it. Don't worry, I'm going to download the chat and I'm going to email it to everybody who uh, signed up for this event. But I'm just kind of giving you that for uh, networking and connections purposes. It's one of the cool things about these online meetings is we can all connect in a way we never were able to do before. Um, this is a good one from Amber. Right now we're delaying routine appointments to reduce exposure to our clients. What is the tipping point for taking seniors to their screening and diagnostic, diagnostic appointments? With a vaccine not coming for at least another year, some non-emergent appointments will be necessary. What, what, I mean, again, I know all these are vague answers, but I'm curious at how, what your thoughts are on that is, is like, what are some of the things that you're looking for to sort of en enable us with confidence to take our clients to an office appointment or to a hospital for that matters? Yeah, great, phenomenal question. And actually, I just had this conversation, this exact same question came up on a televisit I was giving earlier this morning uh, with a patient. So the, it is a moving target. So what I, the general guideline that I'm saying is that for routine screening appointments, things that, um, that you know, you're going for a physical or things that, you know, you're going for a, a basic well child examination, um, just routine visits, those are, are drastically being cut down. Um, the best way to approach that is to talk to your doctor's office and say, hey, you know, I have a regular blood pressure check appointment, um, you know, in two weeks, are you guys still seeing patients for that? Um, chances are the doctor's office will say, no, we're not, but we'll set up a televisit with you, um, which is where you check your blood pressure and then you speak to the doctor on the phone and he or she will, will kind of give some sort of, you know, either refill your medications or whatever it may be. So that, those are for the pure routine visits. Um, elective procedures have pretty much been canceled at most hospitals uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they don't want to use the PPE. Number two, they want to keep those rooms, those ventilators for, for patients who need them uh, due to COVID. So elective procedures have pretty much been, been canceled. The question that I had asked, that the, my patient asked me today was, I'm supposed to go for routine, um, not routine, but um, br uh, breast imaging in, uh, in June. 
and it, it's because she had had um, a uh, uh, an abnormal uh, ex, uh, abnormal imaging study, and the 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 radiologist and the and we had recommended make sure you do a follow up in six months as opposed to a year. So things like that are are actually very important, and you don't want to ignore them because if you that's not a screening appointment that is an actual diagnostic appointment and so if you have been advised to follow up in a period of time that is shorter than what the routine screening period of time would be then that is a conversation you should have with with your doctor um, as far as uh, you know specialist appointments I can only tell you antidotally what uh, what my patients are telling me and what I've spoken to um, I'm doing a lot of calls to cardiologists to pulmonologists to oncologists saying listen my patient um, you know, they're not comfortable coming in. What can I do as a primary care? What lab tests can I order? What imaging studies can I get on your behalf that, that may help them from coming in? And some of the specialists are saying, no, we're, we still need patients to come in and we'll see them. But some of them are saying, yeah, you know what, let's delay their appointment another five months. Um, so it's really case by case, but it starts by speaking to your physician or your, your patient's physician. Yeah, and I guess, None of us have the crystal ball, you know, um, and I, you, so uh, I, I think that was a good answer. The, um, okay, this is uh, Jennifer Schlock Bowles with Fox Trail has another good question. And I don't know if you read this article, so, and you can come on it, comment on it, but it's kind of scary. It says, I just read an article today that there is a developing anecdotal evidence that the virus can linger in a person's eye in the form of conjunctivitis, pink eye, for up to 21 days. Have you heard anything about this? Yeah, so, you know, so th again, think of viruses, right? Think of the common cold. What sort of symptoms would you get? Runny nose, red eyes, think of the flu. Um, you know, you could see it in a person's face when, they're, when they have the flu. Um, so it's not, um, it's, it's scary, but it's not out of, you know, it's not, unusual to hear that, that, you know, the virus can actually live in the mucous membranes, whether it be the nose, the eyes, whether it be in the mouth, the conjunctiva, which is why one of the screenings for patients going or physicians, when I go into a assisted living community, one of the screening questions that I get asked is, have you had um, any runny eyes or itchy eyes or, or conjunctivitis-like symptoms? So um, not an unusual thing to, to see that. Now, as far as how long does it linger, that, that's, that's difficult to know for sure. And I don't have the clear-cut answer because we haven't gotten the guidance from the CDC yet, but it just reiterates the importance of not touching your face. Now, I've probably touched my face a million times while I've been on this chat, and I never realized how much I enjoy touching my face until I've been told it's Another good reason to wear a mask, it's actually. It's a great reason to wear a mask. I'm not... Um, I'm not usually using contacts anymore, and I wear glasses. And you know, you, you know, anything you can do to to prevent um, touching your face is is important. So um, that is a definite possibility that it can last for several weeks. Um, so okay. just be cognizant, washing hands. All right, I think we can get through some of these and um, here and before uh, one o'clock. Um, the this is an interesting question. Most of us have homemade masks in. Man, I tell you what, I'm just so impressed on social media, all these individuals and organizations that are making masks for people. It's just, it's, the, the, the spirit is amazing, you know, you know? And um, do you recommend that they have filters in them? And if so, what should we use to make them? And I know that a lot of the, um, a lot of those are just coffee filters. So you create a, uh, a mask and then it has a little sleeve. What What are your thoughts on that it, compared to just a regular cloth mask that you're going to throw in the washing machine every time you use it? Sure. So, you know, any, the, the more redundancy you have, the better. So the better barrier protection you have, I think makes for a, a better mask. I can tell you that the, the current recommendations are something as basic as just a facial covering. And again, the reason is because that protects the, the large respiratory droplets. Say you're, you're walking and you have to sneeze or you cough, or even as talking, your, your large respiratory droplets do come out. Um, so really the recommendations are just something facial covering is better than nothing. But if you want to to be specific about it, you know, having having filters or coffee filters are being used quite often. Um, and, uh, you know, redundancy is better. 
Cool. Okay. Um, all right. So here's a question from Dennis Haslip. If someone's in the hospital for COVID-19 and stays 14 days there, which um, I'm sure they're trying to get them out far less than 14 days, but um, they sh should they still have to be quarantined for another 14 days after discharge? Yeah, it depends on where they're going. And it's, you know, I, I'll give the example, you know, when you have a, a patient at an assisted living facility being sent out to the hospital, and let's just say they test COVID positive or negative, regardless, and they're there. But then when they come back to the assisted living facility, most living facilities are quarantining them, quarantining them for 14 days um, because you have a large amount of immunocompromised patients in a single building. Um, now, if you, um, you know, when I go to a hospital or an assisted living facility, I'm not quarantining myself. So you can make the argument that, um, that you know, you, you have to go by symptoms, but you just have to be very cognizant that um, you can have asymptomatic viral spread. So really it's a case by case, but if you have a loved one, say, you know, your, your mother or father, they're in the hospital, that's where the sick people are. That's where COVID positive patients are. When they come out of the hospital, they should, in my opinion, limit their exposure for, for a week or two, if they can. Um, you know, obviously within reason, but they shouldn't go out to, well, not that we can go out to gatherings anywhere uh, at this point anyway, but they should really try to limit their exposure um, for, for a week or two, if possible. Um, because we've got about five minutes and, and I'm hoping you're flexible and we could stay on a little yeah. bit longer, but I want to I want to throw something out on the comments section. Um, I want to recognize Sharon Canner from Reston for a Lifetime. It's a village in Reston, and, and we do a lot of partnership things with them. Sharon made a comment in the comment section that there's a gas station in Reston that is selling um, N95 masks. With the remaining time that we have here, if any of you guys have sources for PPDs that are open to the public, Throw those into comments. That will be super helpful for the attendees that are here. Um, thank you, Sharon, for doing that. And thanks, Reston for a Lifetime, and any of the Reston for a Lifetime members that are on the call. Um, okay, Jennifer has another good question for you. Um, if you were doing the HNP, and what is HNP? History and principle. H history and principle. And the capacity assessment in the same visit is it still $600 for the one-time visit, or is there an additional cost because of the two components? It's still the same same cost. Regard, whatever that patient needs, once we make that appointment, regardless of how much or how little, it is, it is the same cost. So most patients, in order to do a good capacity evaluation, um, you kind of have to do history and physical anyway. So, but if you're doing a formal history and physical and a capacity eval, it's it's a one visit and it's it's all covered in the in the same price. Okay, um, and and again, Teresa, boring. I'm just gonna um, pick on you. You just gave us a uh, a good PPD resource, and I reposted it to all panelists and attendees. So on the um, chat, make sure that you're sending this out to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see it. But guys, don't worry, I can download this chat and I'll email it to you guys later this afternoon. Um, okay, we're, we're winding down here and I think I went through all those questions. I think, I, I, unfortunately, I know there's some questions in the chat, but it's, there's so much chat going on, it's hard for me to address that. When I, when I send out a follow-up email, I'm gonna give all the contact uh, info for Dr. Sinha. If there's something that you wanna get out to the group, okay, now this is, this is something that I, here, I'm gonna share my screen real quick because this is how we can keep this dialogue going, um, is we have a really cool resource now, um, the, uh, the pro aging online community okay and i'm going to put bring it up on my screen so you can see what it is so this is this brand new network that we've got over 500 
senior serving providers, a lot of you who are on this, this call today are on here. It's totally free. And what I'm gonna be doing is posting the video, posting the chat here on the, the pro, pro Aging Network. We've got a variety of topics that, that are here and we can keep the discussion going 24 seven in this platform, okay? So you'll get, you'll get a reminder to jump on there to get access to the video and the chat, okay? Um, the other thing that I wanna let you guys know about that's really cool on the Pro Aging Online community is that you can, we've got this one topic here, ask for help and share resources. And this is a great place where you can go and you can, um, you can ask the community for help on a situation. One of the best uh, calls for help was Kay Bransford, who had a client who she's trying to come up with solutions on how to uh, enforce them not driving. And it was amazing the suggestions that are on there. So I'll send everybody a link to this if you haven't joined definitely jump on here. It's a great way for us to keep the dialogue going after this, this call. Um, Dr. Sinha, I just really want to thank you. This was fantastic. And, but, but I, I also really want to thank these great questions. I mean, this is just, it's an amazing presentation when we get the feedback from the audience this way. And this is what, this is what makes, uh, I feel that uh, a presentation like this, had we invited you to speak to our audience live, I don't think it would have been as nearly as engaging. You're able to, you know, really get feedback from the audience the entire time. So, um, thank you. See, one uh, thing I also wanted to, to, to if, if that's okay, just wanted to get out oh, there. No, no. I was going to say closing remarks, anything you want to say. We, um, because of what's happening and because of, you know, I know a lot of people have, have lost their jobs and just it's, you know, healthcare is, is tenuous at best. It's um, extremely critical. And one of the biggest missions as a primary care doctor, and I'm sure every primary care doctor at this point in time is keeping people out of the hospital. So um, what we're doing on our, and it's on our website, and um, you know, we are doing one-time telemedicine visits for, for people um, at a, we, you know, we, we've lowered the price really significantly. Um, so it's a, it's a one-time telemedicine visit. You do not have to be a member of our patient or of our practice to do it. It's a single visit. We can prescribe have chronic medications um, up to a month, uh, usually non-controlled, uh, but we can we can provide, uh, we can call it in and we can do it anywhere in Maryland, Virginia, uh, DC, and in New York as well. Um, we are at this time licensed to take care of people in New York because of the, the crisis. So, um, you know, any res anything that we can do to help, you know, use us as a resource. If it's something that we, we can't do or don't know how to do, we'll work with you to find somebody who can. So yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because because you're kind of tied into uh, 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 other physicians that are similar to you. So if one of our providers in Baltimore is looking for one of your colleagues, you can probably give a recommendation, correct? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Great. Anything we can do to help, we're happy to. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, again, thanks, Dr. Sinha. And uh, I'm going to end the meeting and I'll follow up with everybody later this afternoon with uh, recording the chat transcript and um, a reminder to and Dr. Sinha's contact info and a reminder on how you can jump on the pro aging online community so we can keep this dialogue going. All right. Great. Thank you, everybody. Stay, stay safe. Stay well. Keep doing what you're doing. You bet. Thank you.